Hey everyone, and welcome to the deep dive. You know, we get a lot of questions about PPIs and whether or not people should stay on them. So yeah, we thought it'd be a perfect time to dive into one of the resources that was sent in. It's a patient decision aid, all about making informed choices when it comes to your PPI medication. So are you ready to explore the ins and outs of continuing, adjusting, or maybe even stopping your PPI? Let's get started. I think it's a fantastic resource, especially for anyone who's been taking a PPI for at least four weeks you know, and their symptoms are gone. It really lays out some things to think about, but it doesn't tell you what to do, which I think is, it's really cool. Yeah. I like that too, because it puts the power back in the patient's hands, right? It's about making an informed choice that feels right for you. So let's talk about those choices. This decision aid maps out three main paths, sticking with your current PPI dose, lowering the dose, or switching to what they call on-demand use, where you only take a PPI if those pesky symptoms decide to show up. Now, each of these paths has some potential pros and cons, right? Oh yeah, definitely. For example, the decision aid mentions that if you lower your PPI dose, there's a chance your symptoms might come back. But the good news is that the difference is pretty small. Okay, so how small are we talking? Well, the research estimates that for every 100 people who lower their dose, about six more might experience a recurrence compared to those who stay on the same dose. But you know, the research always has these ranges, right? And in this case, the range is actually pretty wide. It could be anywhere from three fewer people to 19 more people having symptoms. Wow. Okay. So that is a pretty big range. It kind of makes you realize that these estimates aren't always, you know, super precise. Yeah, exactly. And that's why it's so important to think about your own situation. Like, how much would it bother you if those symptoms came back? Would it be a minor inconvenience or would it really disrupt your life? So true. It's all about personalizing this decision. Mm -hmm. Now, what about the option of ditching the daily PPI and going on demand. What are the key things to consider there? Well, according to the research, if you choose the on-demand route, there might be a slightly higher chance of those symptoms coming back. We're talking about maybe seven more people out of every hundred compared to those who stick with their regular PPI. Mm, okay. So potentially a bit more heartburn here and there. But on the flip side, you're probably going to be taking fewer pills every week, right? That's right. On average, people who use PPIs on demand take about 3.8 fewer pills per week. That's pretty interesting. So it seems like it really boils down to this. Do you value taking fewer pills, even if it means a slightly higher chance of heartburn? Or is minimizing symptoms your top priority, mm -hmm. even if it means taking a pill every day? It's all about figuring out what matters most to you. You got it. And there's another important piece of the puzzle to consider here. This decision aid also talks about some potential long-term risks that have been linked to PPI use. Yeah, that's something we hear a lot about these days, and it can feel a bit overwhelming trying to sort through all the information out there. So what are some of the key things this decision aid brings to light? Well, it acknowledges that there's still a lot we don't know for sure about the long-term effects of PPI use, but it does highlight a few specific areas where research has suggested potential risks. For instance, some studies have hinted at a possible connection between PPIs and a slightly increased risk of developing pneumonia. You know, the kind you get out in the community, not in the hospital. Hmm, interesting. Definitely something to think about. For sure. Right. And there's also been some research suggesting a possible link between PPIs and an increased risk of C. difficile infection, especially for folks who've had to take antibiotics for a long time. Okay, so that's two potential risks to consider. What's the third one that jumps out? This one might surprise some people. Hip fractures. Now, this risk seems to be mainly for older adults, but it's still worth noting. Some studies have suggested a possible connection between long-term PPI use and a slightly higher risk of hip fractures. It could be because of the impact PPIs might have on bone health, but more research is needed. Wow. You know, I'd never really thought about that connection before. It just goes to show you how much there is to consider when it comes to making decisions about medication. I know, right? It's not always easy to weigh all these factors. Absolutely. So we've talked about the different options for managing PPI use, the potential benefits, and the potential risks. It can feel like a lot to juggle. So what does this decision aid suggest for actually making a choice? How do you pull the trigger? It offers this really cool tool they call the SURE test. It's a simple checklist with just four questions that can help you figure out if you're ready to make an informed decision. Okay, I love a good checklist. Walk us through those four questions. All right, so the first question is all about checking in with your gut feeling. It asks, do you feel sure about the best choice for you? It's about that sense of confidence, you know, that you're on the right track. Makes sense. So what's the next question on the list? 
The second question is about understanding the information. Do you know the benefits and risks of each option? It's about making sure you've got a good grasp of what each path entails, you know, the potential upsides and downsides. Knowledge is power, right? Yeah. So what about question number three? What's that all about? Question three gets right to the heart of your priorities. Are you clear about which benefits and risks matter most to you? Because what's super important to one person might not be a big deal to someone else. It's all about recognizing that this is a personal decision and your values should guide your choice. So true. There's no right or wrong answer here. It's about what matters most to you. All right. So what's the final question on this sure test? What's the grand finale? The last question is all about making sure you've got the support you need. It asks, do you have enough support and advice to make a choice? It's recognizing that making these kinds of decisions can feel overwhelming and it encourages you to seek guidance if you need it. Yes. Don't be afraid to reach out for help. Mm. So what happens if someone answers no to any of these questions? What does a decision aid recommend? It strongly encourages you to reach out to your doctor or your pharmacist. They're there to help you navigate all this information and make sure you feel good about the choice you make. Absolutely. They can be such valuable resources. It's all about having those open conversations with your healthcare providers, making sure you feel heard and understood. And you know what I really appreciate about this decision aid? It emphasizes that you're not just passively following doctor's orders. You're actively involved in making this decision. Yes, I love that. It's about working together, having a dialogue, and finding a solution that feels right for you. Exactly. It's about that shared decision-making process. It's about feeling empowered to advocate for your own health. And I think that's a powerful message. And that sense of empowerment can make a big difference in how you approach your health. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, another thing I really appreciate about this decision aid is how it handles the whole topic of potential adverse effects. It doesn't shy away from the facts, yeah. but it also doesn't resort to scare tactics. It strikes a really nice balance, I think. I think you're right. The way it uses statistics is particularly interesting. Instead of just throwing out vague statements like PPIs might increase the risk of something, it gives you actual numbers. So you can really grasp the likelihood of experiencing a particular side effect. Can you give us an example of that? Sure. Like, instead of just saying PPIs might increase the risk of pneumonia, it tells you something like, 18 more people out of 10,000 might experience pneumonia. You know, putting it in those concrete terms really helps put things into perspective. Yeah, it definitely makes it easier to wrap your head around the actual magnitude of the risk. Exactly, and it uses that same approach for other potential risks like C. difficile infection and hip fractures. It lays out the numbers clearly and concisely. I like that. It avoids that vague language and really gets specific. I think that helps people make a more informed decision because you can compare those numbers to the potential benefits of continuing your PPI yeah. and decide what level of risk feels acceptable to you. Exactly. It's all about weighing those risks and benefits and finding that sweet spot that feels right for your individual circumstances. It's not about saying PPIs are bad. It's about giving people the knowledge they need to make an empowered choice. Exactly. It's about having all the information and then making a decision that feels right for you, hmm. not one based on fear or incomplete information. You got it. And that's why having these open and honest conversations with your healthcare providers is so crucial. They can help you sort through all the research, navigate the nuances, and ultimately make a decision that aligns with your individual needs and preferences. You know. It's interesting. We often think of medical decisions as being purely scientific based on clear-cut evidence. But this decision aid really highlights the fact that personal values play a huge role, too. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's not just about the data. It's about what matters most to you. Maybe minimizing medication use is a top priority for you, even if it means a slightly higher risk of symptoms returning. Or maybe you really value the peace of mind that comes with knowing your symptoms are under control even if it means taking a PPI long term. Such an important point. There's no right or wrong answer. Mm -hmm. It's all about figuring out what's most important to you and making a decision that feels aligned with your values and priorities. Exactly. And that's where those conversations with your doctor or pharmacist come in. They can help you understand the evidence, explore your options, and ultimately make a choice that feels right for you. It's like having a guide, someone to help you navigate all the twists and turns. I like that analogy. Now, speaking of navigating, let's shift gears a bit and talk about the practical side of things. Let's say you've gone through the decision aid, you've talked to your doctor, and you've decided to try reducing your PPI dose or going on demand. What kind of support is out there to help you through that transition? That's a great question. Because it's one thing to make a decision, but actually putting it into practice can be a whole other challenge. 
especially if you've been symptom-free for a while. The idea of potentially experiencing those uncomfortable sensations again can be a little daunting. It's totally understandable to feel that way. That's why it's so important to have a plan in place. Yeah. You know, a strategy for managing those potential symptoms if they do pop up. So what kind of strategies are we talking about here? What are some things people can do to minimize discomfort if their symptoms return? Well, the Decision Aid itself offers some really helpful tips. It talks about paying attention to lifestyle factors that can contribute to reflux, like avoiding meals close to bedtime, you know, within a couple of hours of hitting the hay. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Lying down with a full stomach is practically asking for heartburn. I know, right? It also mentions things like raising the head of your bed, mm -hmm. you know, using a couple of extra kilos to let gravity help keep those stomach acids down where they belong. I've heard that one before. Every little bit helps. It really does. And for some people, even losing a small amount of weight, especially around the belly, can help reduce pressure on the stomach and lessen the likelihood of reflux. So those are all things people can do on their own without medication. But what about over-the-counter options? Are there any medications people can try if their heartburn comes back? Absolutely. The Decision Aid talks about antacids like Tums or Gaviscon. They work by neutralizing stomach acid, and they can provide pretty quick relief. Ah, uh, yes. The trusty Tums. A classic for a reason. But as always, it's a good idea to check with your doctor or pharmacist before starting any new medication, even over-the-counter ones. Couldn't agree more. They can help you make sure it's safe and won't interact with any other medications you're taking. Sound advice. So we've got lifestyle changes, over-the-counter remedies. Is there anything else people can do to support themselves during this transition, maybe on a mental or emotional level? That's a really important point. As we talked about earlier, there's often a psychological component to making these decisions, especially when it comes to the possibility of experiencing symptoms again. Even if you know, logically, that occasional heartburn is totally normal and manageable. It can still be frustrating or even anxiety provoking when it happens. For sure. So what are some ways people can manage that anxiety? Well, things like mindfulness and stress management techniques can be incredibly helpful. Deep breathing exercises, meditation, even just spending time in nature. All of those things can help calm your nervous system and reduce anxiety. Those are all great suggestions. It's about taking a holistic approach. Recognizing that our mental and emotional well-being are just as important as our physical health. You got it. And it's also about being kind to yourself. It's totally normal to feel a bit apprehensive about reproducing your PTI dose or going on demand. It's a change, and change can be tough. Absolutely. Acknowledge those feelings. Yeah. Validate them. And then find healthy ways to cope. And remember, you're not alone in this. Millions of people experience heartburn and acid reflux. And there are tons of resources out there to support you. Don't hesitate to reach out to your doctor, a therapist, or even a support group. There's a whole community out there ready to help you navigate this journey. I love that reminder. You don't have to go through this alone. Sometimes, just knowing that others are going through something similar can make all the difference in the world. It really can. There's so much shared wisdom and support out there. You know, it's kind of amazing how this conversation started with PPIs, mm -hmm. these tiny little pills. Mm -hmm. And now we're talking about everything from the importance of shared decision-making to the power of self-care and community support. It's true. It's fascinating how these seemingly small decisions can open up these bigger conversations about how we approach our health and well-being. I think it speaks to the fact that health is so much more than just the absence of disease. It's about living a full, vibrant life, a life that feels aligned with your values and priorities. I love that. It's about embracing the whole person, not just focusing on symptoms. Now, speaking of symptoms, I think it's also really important to talk about the flip side of this decision. We've talked a lot about the potential risks of PPIs, but what about the potential risks of not taking PPIs if you really need them? That's such a crucial point. It's easy to get caught up in worrying about the potential downsides of medication, but it's equally important to understand the potential consequences of not treating a condition adequately. Exactly. It's all about finding that balance where the benefits outweigh the risks. Yeah. So let's talk about the potential risks of untreated acid reflux. What can happen if those volcano eruptions in your stomach keep happening unchecked? Okay. Paint us a picture. What are we talking about here? Well, in the short term, it can mean a lot of discomfort. Frequent heartburn, that burning sensation in your chest and throat, maybe even difficulty swallowing, it can really impact your quality of life. Oof. I've been there. Mm -hmm. And it's not fun. Definitely not fun. And beyond that immediate discomfort, there can be more serious long-term consequences. Okay, like what 
what kind of damage can untreated acid reflux do over time? One concern is the development of something called esophagitis. That's basically inflammation of the esophagus. All that stomach acid splashing up can irritate and damage the lining of your esophagus, leading to pain, bleeding, and difficulty swallowing. That sounds pretty serious. Is it treatable? Yes, it's treatable, but it's definitely something you want to avoid if possible. And if it's not treated, esophagitis can progress to even more serious conditions like Barrett's esophagus. Barrett's esophagus. I've heard of that but I'm not exactly sure what it is. So Barrett's esophagus is a condition where the cells lining your esophagus, they start to change and look more like the cells that line your intestines. And it's considered a precancerous condition. Precancerous. So that means it increases your risk of developing esophageal cancer. That's right. It doesn't necessarily mean you'll develop cancer, but it does increase your risk. And esophageal cancer is a very serious and often aggressive type of cancer. Wow. Okay. Definitely not something to mess around with. So it sounds like the decision of whether or not to take a PPI isn't as simple as just weighing the risks of the medication itself. Exactly. You also have to consider the potential risks of untreated acid reflux. It's about finding that middle ground where you're managing your symptoms effectively and minimizing your overall risk. It's a balancing act for sure. And it sounds like it's not a decision to make on your own. It's definitely something to discuss with your doctor. Absolutely. They can help you assess your individual risk factors and figure out the best course of action for your situation. Now, speaking of individual risk factors, hmm. I'm wondering if there are certain people who are more likely to have complications from untreated acid reflux. Are there any red flags people should watch out for? That's a great question. And the answer is yes. There are definitely some things that can increase your risk. Like what? What are some things people should be aware of? Well, one thing to pay attention to is the severity and frequency of your symptoms. If you're having frequent and intense heartburn, especially if it's interfering with your daily life, that's a clear sign you should talk to your doctor. Makes sense. If it's messing with your sleep, your work, your ability to enjoy life, yeah, it's not something to ignore. Definitely not. And another red flag is the presence of what we call alarm symptoms. Things like difficulty swallowing, unexplained weight loss, vomiting blood, or black stools. Oh, wow. Those are some scary symptoms. I'd be on the phone with my doctor ASAP if I experienced any of those. You and me both. Those are signs that something more serious might be going on and you need to get checked out right away. So don't try to tough it out. Pay attention to those alarm symptoms. Exactly. It's also important to be aware of your family history. If you have a close relative who's had esophageal cancer or Barrett's esophagus, make sure to let your doctor know. Right, because genes can play a role. They definitely can. And finally, Smoking and excessive alcohol consumption are both known to increase the risk of complications from untreated acid reflux. So those are habits worth considering as well. So the key takeaway here is to be informed, be aware of your symptoms, mm -hmm. and have open communication with your healthcare providers. I think that sums it up perfectly. It's about taking ownership of your health and mm -hmm. making informed decisions that feel right for you. You know, this whole conversation has really highlighted for me the importance of preventative health care. I couldn't agree more. It's about taking steps to prevent health problems before they arise, not just reacting to them after they've already developed. Exactly. And that can involve simple things like maintaining a healthy weight, eating a balanced diet, and avoiding trigger foods. Right. And finding healthy ways to manage stress. Because stress can really do a number on our digestive systems. Things like exercise, meditation or getting outdoors can go a long way in preventing acid reflux. It all comes back to that holistic approach, doesn't it? Mm. Taking care of our minds and bodies. Absolutely. And I think it's also important to remember that health is a journey, not a destination. It's about making conscious choices every day that support our overall well-being, not just looking for a quick fix. Beautifully said. You know, this deep dive has really opened my eyes to the complexity of acid reflux and how much our understanding of it has evolved, even in recent years. It really has. What we thought we knew about treating it even a few years ago might be completely different now. That's why it's so important to stay informed, to keep those lines of communication open with your healthcare providers, and to be open to adjusting your approach as needed. It's about recognizing that health is a dynamic process, not a static state. And speaking of staying informed, I think it's worth noting that the research on PPIs and their long-term effects is constantly evolving. New studies are being published all the time, and our understanding of these medications is constantly being refined. So it's important to stay curious, to keep learning, and to revisit your treatment plan periodically with your doctor. 
Because what might have been the best approach a few years ago might not be the best approach today. Exactly. It's about being an active participant in your health journey and being willing to adapt as new information comes to light. Right. Because ultimately, it's your body, your health, and your choice. Absolutely. And yeah. you deserve to have all the information and support you need to make those choices with confidence. You know, it, it's amazing to me how this conversation started with PPIs. And it's broadened into this discussion about the patient-provider relationship, the importance of shared decision-making, and the constantly changing world of medical research. It's true. I think it just goes to show that health isn't just about treating physical symptoms. It's about our mental, emotional, and social well-being, too. Absolutely. It's about recognizing that everyone's health journey is unique, and there's no one-size-fits-all approach. And that's what makes it so fascinating, right? It's about honoring that diversity of human experience and figuring out what works best for you as an individual. I love that. So as we move into the final part of our deep dive, uh -huh. let's shift our focus to the personal side of this decision. Sounds great. I'm looking forward to exploring that. So we've talked a lot about the science of PPIs mm. and the potential risks and benefits. Yeah. You know, I think it's also important to acknowledge the emotional and personal side of making this decision. Oh, for sure. It's not just a purely scientific decision. There are definitely feelings involved. Absolutely. And one thing I really appreciate about this decision aid is how it emphasizes the importance of personal values. Yes. It recognizes that these medical decisions, they're rarely black and white. Right. It's not just about looking at the data and saying, okay, this is the right answer. It's about figuring out what matters most to you as an individual. Exactly. What are you willing to compromise on? Yeah. What are your non-negotiables? It helps you clarify your priorities when it comes to your health and well-being. And that's where I think the SURE test is so valuable. Those four questions really prompt you to think about what matters most to you. It's true. Like, am I truly comfortable with this decision? Or... Do I really understand the risks and benefits? Those questions force you to dig a little deeper and make a choice that's aligned with your values, not just what someone else is telling you to do. I love that. It's about taking ownership of your health yeah. and making a conscious decision, not just going through the motions. Exactly. You're an active participant, yeah. not just a passive bystander. You know, it's interesting to think about how our values can change over time. Mm -hmm. What might have been a top priority for us a few years ago might not be as important now. Oh, absolutely. Our lives change. Our perspectives change. And our values naturally shift right along with them. That's why I think it's so important to revisit these kinds of decisions periodically. And just to make sure your approach still feels right. Make sure it still aligns with your needs and priorities. I couldn't agree more. It's an ongoing conversation with yourself. Checking in and making adjustments as you go. It's about staying connected to yourself and honoring what truly matters to you. I love that. And you know, while this decision aid is a fantastic tool, mm -hmm. it's important to remember that it's just one piece of the puzzle. It's not meant to replace that conversation with your doctor. Right. It's a starting point, something to help you prepare for that conversation with your doctor, mm -hmm. to think through the issues and make sure you feel confident expressing your thoughts and concerns. Exactly. It's all about that collaboration between you and your healthcare provider. Mm -hmm. They can help you make sense of all the information and guide you toward a decision that feels right for you. You know, it's easy to get caught up in all the talk about potential risks of medications, especially PPIs. And those risks are definitely important to consider. But I think it's also crucial to remember that for a lot of people, PPIs are incredibly effective. They can really make a big difference in their quality of life. Absolutely. For people who are dealing with severe acid reflux or GERD, PPIs can be life-changing. They can relieve those debilitating symptoms, help people enjoy eating again, and even prevent some serious complications down the road. Exactly. So this decision aid isn't about saying PPIs are bad and you should stop taking them. Not at all. It's about providing information, mm -hmm. encouraging thoughtful consideration, and empowering people to make choices that align with their individual needs and preferences. And everyone's experience with PPIs is going to be different. Some people might need to take them long term, while others might be able to reduce their dose or go to that on-demand approach. The important thing is to find what works for you. And your doctor can help you with that. Absolutely. Yeah. This whole conversation has really emphasized for me how important it is to have open and honest communication with your healthcare providers. Couldn't agree more. It's about feeling comfortable asking questions, expressing your concerns, and sharing your values and priorities. It's about building a relationship of trust and mutual respect. It's about feeling like a partner in your healthcare, not just a patient. 
Exactly. And I think that's a great place to wrap things up. We've explored the science behind PPIs, the decision-making process, and ultimately it comes down to trusting yourself, advocating for your needs, and working with your doctor to find the best path forward. I think that's beautifully said. We've covered a lot of ground today, and I hope this deep dive has been helpful and empowering for everyone listening. If you're thinking about making changes to your PPI use, I encourage you to keep exploring this topic and talk to your doctor. They can help you make the best decision for your individual needs. Thanks for joining us today on The Deep Dive. It's been a pleasure, and we'll see you next time.